Hello, and welcome to Eddie Hurst's podcast version of The War of the Worlds, the show where each episode I, Eddie Hurst, take a chapter of the sci-fi classic The War of the Worlds, because that's the title, and stick it in a blender, add in chats with comedians, comedy songs, and deep dives of research, switch it on, and serve up a smoothie of audio deliciousness. Smoothie and sci-fi. This week, we're having an interlude. We're taking a little break from the novel for a very special chat. But get this. This ain't no personal comedy friend. This is a sci-fi expert. For regular listeners, you may remember in chapter one, I spoke about Victorian racism. And in it, I said... So, like... Unless he was the one person within the scientific establishment who for some reason didn't think these sort of views, he probably definitely agreed with it. And if you're not a regular listener, uh, why not go back and listen to it all? And maybe this is a spicy take, but for me, chapter one, I think, is the best place to start a book. Anyway, whilst I said that about Wells at the time, it turns out he kind of wasn't. Whilst he was aware of and friends with people who researched and and, and suggested eugenics, Well was by no means a proponent of this line of thought. I've already spoken a bit about this in earlier episodes, but I sat down with writer and producer Simon Gerrier to discuss Herbert George, eugenics, and how he inspired Doctor Who. That's H.G. Wells inspiring Doctor Who. I mean, Simon literally writes Doctor Who scripts, so I don't know if that counts as inspiring it or not. I mean, that's... That's sort of like saying a chef inspired a cake when actually what they did was all the work and the ingredients and the baking. It just, it, it doesn't feel right to me when they've had such a hands-on part of it to say they inspired it. Pretty direct inspiration is what I'm saying. Simon is a prolific science fiction writer who has worked on countless Doctor Who audio dramas for all-round top lads big finish, as well as novels and scripts for a whole array of existing and new science fiction shows and stories. He's also produced a number of both audio and visual, and sometimes audio-visual, documentaries for H.G. Wells. So naturally, he's a perfect guest for schooling me, and you, on the life and times of our beloved little Martian maker. Just before we start, please subscribe to the podcast and give us a five-star written review on Apple Podcasts, because why not? I mean, even if you don't listen on Apple, it takes a few minutes to write something, but it massively helps the podcast. Like, a few weeks ago, we were in the top 100 sci-fi podcasts in the UK, which is mad, and that was thanks only to, like, two new reviews. So, I mean, just imagine how much a single review from you would help. Hey, and don't even imagine it, do it! Be the change you want to see in the world. You can also follow me on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram for the latest with the podcast as well as jokes and videos at Eddie Hurst, that's E-D-Y Hurst. Anyway, set your ears to listen, set your mind to open and get ready to receive this wonderful chat with the fantastic Simon Gerrier. Hello, hey Simon Gerrier, thank you very much for joining me. How are you doing? I am doing very well, thank you for having me. You're very welcome. Can you tell, can you hear that my voice has changed slightly from what was a nice conversational tone prior and now I've gone, hello, this is my voice. Uh, Uh, Oh, I thought... Very Radio Four. And, uh, yeah, that. What this is what I, I'm, I'm aiming for a, for an air of professionalism uh, <laughs> to, to trick you. <laughs> Before we uh, chat, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit? Yeah. So uh, I'm Simon Garrier. I'm a writer and sometime producer. I produced a Sunday feature documentary for Radio Three a few years ago about H.G. Uh, Wells and uh, the hydrogen bomb. Uh, he was the, the man who invented the term atomic bomb for his novel The World Set Free. And that novel, although it got the sort of physics wrong, it misunderstood the physics, he thought uh, uh, an atomic bomb would be a grenade that never stopped exploding. But that novel then inspired the physicist Leo Zillard to work out the chain reaction process in the in the 1930s that actually led to the development of uh nuclear weapons so uh, uh, a weird a weird kind yeah. of yes with my uh, uh presenter samira ahmed we we sort of went down that rabbit hole really uh, i also made a documentary about hg wells's influence on doctor who which is included on the dvd of the doctor who story the ark from 1966 i write doctor who books and comics and audio plays and and i've written about wells and stuff elsewhere as well Amazing. I mean, you're you're in many ways far more qualified than me to run this podcast. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. I, uh, I've read, I've read a few books and yeah. uh, I've interviewed some people. Yeah. Uh, but but usually when your uh, uh, email came in, I was thinking, no, this is not normally what I do. I go and find people who know yeah. what they're talking, about. and I ask. <laughs> I, I I'm going to have to do some reading. 
Um, oh well thank you very much thank you for reading on my behalf that's very kind of you i did want to say um so i your your documentary and the article was a huge influence on one of the deep dives i did um a couple of chapters ago which was on sci-fi predicting the future and it's interesting and sort of terrifying with wells i find that like he wrote about the atomic bomb and it was sort of like a warning. And rather than people going, oh, right, we should be careful about this. Somebody went, ah, can we make this happen? Yeah, yeah. But it's quite a lot of that in sci-fi. Yeah. Um, the, the, the issue with futurism, which is what, what Wells talked about, is, is that as long as you churn out enough predictions or anticipations, as, as Wells called them, as long as you churn out enough of them, some of them are going to be right. Yeah. And what, what nobody really does is keeps a tally of going, well, you know, how many predictions did he have? put in anticipations how many of them was he was he close to and stuff um so yeah i i think um i think it's really interesting that he whereas an awful lot of uh, science fiction looks very far into the future and kind of kind of makes a yeah. great leap what wells was often very interested in was where what's the next step what's what's a, a sort of reachable goal um and so yeah so so some of his stuff is really interesting um, and and it's not just it's not just the sort of technology that he predicts. It's also what things will look and feel like. Yeah. His 1936 film Things to Come. Yeah, yeah. The depiction of aerial bombardment of, of a blitz feels like it's from after the Second World War. Yeah. Because yeah. all the what that is feels very credible. Now you know there there had been aerial bombardments in the. Uh, uh, First World War and, you know, Zeppelins flying over London. There had been uh, uh, balloon, balloons dropping bombs on cities before. But but it feels so specific and so yeah, sure. accurate um, that, that, yeah, that, that, that there is definitely something in what he was doing. Um, you also have to kind of go, yes, he, he his atomic bomb was thrown by hand out of a biplane. And it's a, literally you have to pull the pin out of it as you throw it. <laughs> and, um you know, and I th I, if I remember rightly, the guy flying the plane has to let go of the controls of the plane to f throw the attack. <laughs> I think that I think they should bring that as a thing that because you know, there's um I can't remember who it is. There's a writer who talks about um the president of the United States to get access to the red button for the nuclear bomb should have to get, it should be implanted in somebody, and they should have to kill that person to get right. it out. It's like that. If you are, if if you have the courage and you believe it's important enough that you should stop flying your airplane to try and pull a pin out and chuck it. <laughs> if you've, if you, yeah. although yeah. maybe if you're that reckless, maybe you shouldn't be trusted with it at all. Oh no, I'm going to have to revise this. There, there, there's something, uh, you know, a weird mashup of um, Clive Barker and Heath Robinson in what you're proposing. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like that's a lot of Wells's stuff. Is that sort of the the Victorian ingenuity and terror of existential threat? Yeah, yeah. This is one of the things that is fascinating about Wells as a writer um, of ideas and of the sci-fi and the predictions you see is that he does change a lot. Being up to the minute, I think you really see his reflection of what he's sort of thinking at the time of writing, which is what I wanted to ask you about. Is so in the first chapter of the book, I I think I think in hindsight I gave him a bit of a short shrift. He talks about he talks about the Tasmanian massacre, which put put me on a rabbit hole looking down eugenics and Victorian racism and how that sort of led to that getting baked into science at the time. Um, a lot of racism around thinking that people of different colour are different species, which is bizarre and completely backwards, but at that time was taken as a, as a legitimate sort of scientific endeavour to look at. Um, and that's reflected in War of the Worlds. Not directly, I don't think, but as a sort of side note, you know it's an idea in the shadows, in a way. Um, and But then he completely changes his mind. <laughs> like... In the space of about 20, 30 years, he's he's changed from being somebody who will say things about um, white people being a superior race, um, although not specifically, and then changes to talking out about racism and talking about universal rights. I think I think it's actually sooner than that. I think yeah. I think you're absolutely right. You can see what Wells is reading and what he's thinking about. He is voracious in his reading and in his writing. He is really also restless as well he's continually rethinking and and he's not like an awful lot of writers who are radical in their youth and then stick to their guns yeah. and sort of 
bed down into that that ideology and so because so by the end of their lives are seen as reactionaries he is continually revising what he's saying i think the tasmanian massacre issue is is what because what he's basically drawing a link to is is the idea of super of uh, of uh, our as the reader as you know his projected yeah. reader of white middle class readers that we feel ourselves to be superior to the people involved in that massacre and yet we are about to be massacred in the same way that, that, yeah, that yeah. What, he's, what he's doing it's the same thing that he does in the opening paragraph about observation uh, uh, the observation of bacteria i mean that's that's um setting up the end of the novel yeah, and sure, it's beautifully a uh, uh, bit of you know foreshadowing of, of the end but it's also about that kind of sense of scale that we think we're so superior and powerful and yet actually relatively we are tiny like bacteria on a, on a different scale and i think that is what that is what his reference to the the Tasmania massacre is about yes it reads very glibly it's it's a it's a very um as as you say it's quite a you know shock to read because it just it just seems so wrong by the uh standards of today but i think i don't i don't want in any way to excuse how he talks about it yes the way that he talks about it is a is racist but it's probably how it was spoken of yeah in the sure papers at the time and what he's trying to emulate in war of the worlds is that kind of journalistic narration. There's a part of me that wonders how much the way he phrases that, and it's a bit of glib and offhand, is a, is a story technique. Yeah, yeah. Then it is a reflection of his own views of the Tasmanian massacre. Because he's, in his descriptions of what happens to London and, yeah. and what happens to Woking, he's pretty, you know, we know exactly what side he's on, the horror of this. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And, and to make the allusion to... Tasmania. It's not that he's saying that what happened in Tasmania was good or worthy or was putting down, you know, inferior yeah. people in a welcome way. It's not. It's not that kind of uh, no, sure, yeah. Yeah. reference. So, um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I totally take your point about the glibness of it, but, but I think, I think there's more to it than that. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I think it's clunky and possibly a little tone deaf, but then again. I mean, he does compare he does compare it to dodos later on, and also I think it's in a lot of ways you can look at War of the Worlds, and this is something I haven't looked into yet. A lot of the times, it's like there's that colonial fiction of the time where it was sort of imagine if Britain was invaded by some colonial power, and this is kind of like the the hyper version of this. So, yeah. and you've got you know the militarization in Prussia and Germany. Um, so you've got, you know, you can compare it thing, to things like there's a novel called The Battle of Dorking, um, which is from uh, uh, 1870 something, I think. Um, and that is in itself informed by the siege of Paris in 1870, 71, right. um, in which, you know, I mentioned balloons and stuff before. Yeah. That's when balloons were being used. Um, and it was seen that this imperial power of yeah. France was 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 conquered basically wow yeah, 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 yeah and and yeah so questions were being asked about the professionalization of the army and about you know all the stuff about the um the great uh a dreadnought in war of the worlds and stuff yeah. that's that's all playing with those things that that is our best weapon yeah you know that's that's you know that, that's what what's going on there i mean you mentioned eugenics earlier because of knowing you were going to raise this i, I was thinking yeah. about war of the worlds i think it's interesting that both war of the worlds and the time machine have what is supposedly a advanced civilization whether it's the eloi or the martians who have somehow lost some of the grit and vigor that with which to survive life that, that, that they are weak for all that they are advanced and i think that actually taps in although that's that's tied up in eugenics i think that ties that into an earlier sort of debate about whether the the wealthy and the the upper classes were breeding out desirable traits and stuff so you have things about um uh you know john ruskin gave a, a talk about the way that the girls should be educated 
and that they should do exercise and dance and stuff because it would make them stronger and then they were less likely to die in childbirth and and that that you know playing games at school and physical sport and exercise and stuff would be good for people generally and i think eugenics adopts a lot of that stuff what's interesting in in terms of wells's own views on this in um i mentioned anticipations his his sort of book of predictions from uh, 1901 um and he puts forward their unashamedly eugenicist ideas he he refers to the extinction of the unfit um and when he talks about the extinction you it's very hard not with our modern sensibility yeah, sure. with, with, with retrospect not to think of gas chambers and i don't think that's necessarily what he meant i think he meant bearing in mind that he was a lower middle class guy who who you know lived a fairly rough life i think yeah. what he meant was the betterment of standards and feeding people and stuff but that's not how it how it reads and, and so he seems to completely embrace those kind of ideas um and there's a long passage in anticipations about about what we should be doing to improve the i mean people people would refer to it as the sort of stock of uh of british yeah. or white humanity or whatever you know all, all those kind of racially charged things but it's in may 1904 so only a couple of years after that book wells is part of a debate at the, at the london school of economics where the uh, sociology society gets francis galton the guy who who named eugenics and uh, uh carl pearson uh, i think was there as well and carl pearson is like the the darker worst version of uh, you know without any of the fun stuff about how to cut a cake carl pearson, yeah. carl, carl pearson is in the 30s when other people who've advocated eugenics are going maybe this is not Maybe what's going on in Germany is not the thing we should be saying. Pearson's going, no, no, I think they've got it absolutely right. This oh, is what he's a, he's a, yeah, he, he's a unpleasant individual. But Wells at this debate mocks them. Yeah, actually, he stands up and kind of goes, yeah, that, according to according to Galton, the sons of bishops are the people who should produce the best babies. Yeah. And criminals should not be allowed to breed. But surely if you're a criminal, then you've got courage and you've got enterprise and you've got a bit of get up and go. That's yeah. exactly the sort of traits we want. Yeah, what yeah. have Bishop's sons got that we want in our race? And that, and he also makes the point that he also makes the, the point that somebody in a criminal life, it's not nature that has, you know, you, you don't become a criminal because yeah. you're a criminal in a sort of genetic way, you do that because of the conditions that you're brought up in. It's nurture versus, versus nature. And I think that is what Wells is much more on. And that is because of who he is. He is not like Galton, a well-off layabout intellectual who s sort of dreams up these great schemes that just so happen to say that who I am, you know, Galton wrote a, is it can't say where his sci-fi novel in which, a, a man who is a, a basically an elderly man who is basically Galton is required to have sex with beautiful young women <laughs> in scenes that were pornographic to the extent that after his death, his family cut those bits out of the manuscript. Mm. Galton's kind of self aggrandizement and self justification. Yeah. It's, you know, it, it is the kind of thing that it, it, you can kind of go. His idea of eugenics is that elderly bald men with big sideburns should <laughs> To, to sleep yeah. with else. Wells is not Wells is basically about that people should, people should be able to better themselves yeah. and that he, as a lower middle class person who's made it through his hard graft and his skill and his intellect and his writing and his you know hunger for learning that's what he's that's what I would argue he is he is championing sure. while at the same time going and in liberating everybody I can have sex with all the women I want <laughs> You know, that's that's where Galton and Wells would have. Yeah, seen. sure, sure. Yeah, it's like it's it's just something on the side for Wells, isn't it? <laughs> it just so happens that he's uh, <laughs> he held moral convictions that we should all be better and freer yeah. and liberated. Um, include, you know, him going off on bicycle rides with pretty girls. Sure. Well, at least he learned to ride the bicycle, unlike the narrator. But you know, I mean, people react. We're, we're all reacting in our own way to to global global shifts at the moment so <laughs> maybe it's not fair for me to judge him so harsh on that yeah 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 
what what would Wells have done in lockdown? Um, no. I don't know. Actually, you know, he'd love the. I think actually, I don't know if he'd have a nightmare with the internet or he'd have a great time, because it's because he's the sort of he's the sort of guy who like like you see it. He's not afraid to very publicly change his mind, and you see this learning journey with him, um, which I think is why it's sort of it's like he he takes a lot of criticism criticism on board and he takes contradictory ideas. It's like you said, you know, he's quite. It feels more like he's a lot more humble than many sci-fi writers are um, and many science writers are in that he's not getting his ego involved in why he's going to hold on to an idea if that's is that fair to, i mean i don't want to project stuff onto him but i feel like so like with eugenics he'll write about and work with people who are researching it and talking about it like learned from huxley and by all accounts i've not seen anywhere that he has a massive spat with him immediately um, but then he does change his mind and he does talk out about racism and out about eugenics. Um, yeah, Huxley, I think, if I remember right, so Huxley was a huge influence on Wells yeah. and on not only his thinking in terms of the ideas that he, he was propounding, but also his attitude to science, that, that if evidence um, came up that, that yeah. you know, that destroyed your deeply held belief, then you then you embrace that evidence and you 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 know shift to a new paradigm. Um, if I remember rightly, Wells sent Huxley a signed copy of the Time Machine when it was published. Yeah. Never got a response, <laughs> and that's part basically because Huxley was dying. I think he died like oh, okay. or something. So so Huxley never saw wells kind of explode into the oh, main right. game that that i wonder what huxley would have made of him uh because huxley was not backward in expressing his views good or bad mm. um i think i think i i find it hard to imagine that huxley would have been delighted to see his life's work in lecturing turned into the time machine <laughs> <laughs> I, I I don't know I don't know maybe maybe he'd have been flattered but but yeah I I can see more caustic remarks than yeah sure but I'd be fascinated to know what Huxley had made of Wells. yeah sure so I don't think we have anything on what Huxley thought of Wells as a student what I've what I've seen from researching is that it's more it's very one way really and it and it would be you know well, well yeah. I'm not sure you would particularly notice him in a crowd in his early days and stuff and he was going to the courses and Huxley obviously had lots of students yeah. and stuff so yeah yeah I, I but i'd be fascinated no, he, presumably huxley must have seen some of wells's essays and yeah sure work and stuff so yeah yeah maybe there's some i, I will dig i will dig further yeah yeah I, i'd be fascinated to know yeah i'll let you know um so uh good good they've done done the difficult bit <laughs> <laughs> so well not difficult but problematic i think he typifies the idea of science changing its mind and it seems a lot like he relishes the idea of being proven wrong about something which yeah. is really nice to see somebody do i think also um there's a bit in um michael sherban's uh biography um hg wells another kind of life where he says that what you have to remember is that is that wells had trained as a teacher in physics and chemistry in a kind of physics and chemistry where the atom was the base unit of everything so that you know everything was rather concrete and it was like or, or, or you know everything was made up of like billiard balls and you could understand the makes of stuff within a couple of years of him qualifying all of that had been blown out of the water so he was no longer so everything that he kind of based his career on yeah sure he had to relearn um and you can see there's a whole generation of people who, who never quite get to grips with or, 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 or don't want to get to grips with this new kind of science and this new kind of ideas. And Wells, I think, probably under the influence of Huxley, just goes, this is really exciting. Yeah, sure. And there's things in this. And he is reading, um, I mean, the the... the the paper that he read, the, the, the place that he got the idea for the atomic bomb from, for the world set free, is it's a reasonably obscure, reasonably high level academic paper. 
yeah. that Wells was either drawn to because he was reading something else or somebody recommended or whatever, but he's reading some, some high end stuff. And then, and, and that's just one example. And he's reading a lot of stuff. And then he is converting this, almost translating it into accessible material for the mass readership. Yeah. And that's an extraordinary thing. And there, there's lots going on there. I'm not sure he's always right. I'm not sure he's actually bothered about being right. I think his more thing is, here's an interesting thing, here's an interesting thing, yeah. here's an interesting thing. And it's never his, it's, it, he never feels the need to be consistent. And I suppose that's what makes him, that, that's what makes it harder to pin down what his views actually were, you know. Yeah how much of a, compared, compared to a kind of mean level of racism and sexism and colonialism, colonialist yeah. attitudes and whatever, where, where did he sit in that? I think, I mean, he was definitely progressive. He was definitely out to change things for the better. But, but where he, what he actually believed yeah. and how long he believed it is, is quite difficult to pin down. Yeah, absolutely. But all those ideas that he just sort of, like an ideas factory, um, just throwing things out, letting other people take them and run with them, um, brings me sort of to my next question, which is um, you yourself are, are very involved in Doctor Who writing, in the world of Doctor Who. Um, and I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about ways that Wells and his work, and especially War of the Worlds, has gone on to influence Doctor Who. So Doctor Who began in 1963, uh, in November 1963, and... Um, by which time Wells had been dead for almost 20 years. Um, but he was a, a you know, he was a, a, a major figure in science fiction and in British culture. Uh, and he has a big influence. I think if you have a, a TV show about a time machine um, and a mysterious traveller who can travel, you know, and, and, and kind of philosophizes about the places he goes sure. to, the influence of Wells is there right from the start. And... Wells, you know, the War of the Worlds is the sort of archetypal invasion yeah, sure. story, which is still something that Doctor Who does now. But Wells himself was basing that on stuff that pre-existed. I mean, he, he was influenced by uh, Daniel Defoe's Diary of the Plague Year and that rep reportage thing. So, so there's lots of things. There are, there are specific stories that I think deliberately owe something to Wells. So the arc from 1966, there's a 1985 story called Time Lash in which Doctor Who meets H.G. Wells. Amazing. Uh, and the idea is that, that the events of that story inspire some of Wells's books. I was eight when that was on TV and I was convinced that Herbert was going to be Doctor Who's new companion. Oh no, I'm so sorry. Uh, I still think that would be a great idea. I tried yeah. pitching that and nobody, because because they play because they play, you know, the 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 fact that he's H.G. Wells is only revealed in the last line, right? Of, okay, and he's called Herbert and he's a bit of an idiot, which is a great idea. Yeah, but yeah absolutely. With with the greatest respect to to writer Glenn McCoy, I don't think it's the most diligently researched portrait of the young H.G. Wells. <laughs> and the dates don't quite add up. He was known as Bertie, not Herbert. Um, yeah, there's there's some odd bits and pieces. I, I think it's a really engaging performance, and and I, it's not a particularly well regarded story, but I adore it a lot. Um, Amazing, I uh, I do. There's quite a, there's quite a few um, things in fiction of H. G. Wells himself appearing as a character. Yeah, um, like do you know? Um, there's a stand-up comedian in America called Paul F. Tompkins, but he does a lot of characters as well. I um, mean, he does the character of H. G. Wells. Um, and he's made a whole podcast of it called Dead Authors. What's it called? Dead Dead Authors Society, I think. Where H. G. Wells uses his time machine to go and interview all of these really interesting authors that he speaks to. It's it's always it's interesting to see how much Wells as a sort of character himself comes into the much more than. Yeah, it's it's also interesting that Wells is often depicted. As being, because his writing is so confident and so accessible, he's often depicted as being this rather athletic, well-spoken man. But we've got recordings of his voice and we've got photos of him. And I think, you know, even some of his lovers referred to how, what a peculiar body he has. You know, it's like this spindly little toad. Right. <laughs> I think is how, is that how Rebecca West described him? I can't remember. Right. Uh, but he's got, and his voice is really like this, and it's very like, yeah. 
he speaks in a weird kind of thing. Uh, <laughs> While proposing the obliteration of yeah. the fit and stuff. Um, that, that is partly why I think we, we have to be careful when we you know read his views on the extinction of the unfit, because he was not a well man. Yeah, sure. Though he was very long lived. Um, so when he's talking about that stuff, surely he's talking about himself as well. He's very human in his, um, I don't know if that's a weird way to put it, but he's not so, he's more practical, I think, a lot of the time when it comes to ideas. Like, like with the time machine, you can see it's sort of, it's, it's a warning of con- completely separating society rather than it is, this is going to happen. It's like, a re- in a way, it's a reductio ad absurdum of the, of the, the class system at that time. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think, I also think his, his politics, there, there's a big difference between Wells and some of his contemporary socialists yeah. in the sort of societies of Fabians and whatever. Part of Wells's thing is that it's not about a patrician handing out charity to other people. Wells is coming at it from his own lived experience. Yeah, sure. And I think, you know, in The Time Machine, the, the world that he depicts of the Eloi, I mean, I'm not the first person to say this, but, but there, it has been suggested that that is a, um, has been influenced by his time living with his mum while she was working at Upark. And that his idea of the, the two classes, unlike a lot of people who talk about eugenics or social reform, he's not talking about something we do to other people. He's saying this is how my people can be, people yeah. like can be aided. And he's, you know, he's not drawing up the ladder. He's literally trying to share the wealth. That's, that seems to be what he's about. Um, in answer to Doctor Who, though, I think it's interesting that the, the Doctor, certainly in a lot of 20th century Doctor Who, is in some ways a colonial figure. He's a traveller. Yeah, yeah. He comes with, he travels with the kind of authority of the colonial powers. And he's a, he's a, we learn he's a kind of aristocrat. He's a time lord and and this sort of stuff. And he has a moral uh, authority and, um, and it's sort of imperial fervor about the way that he, you know, when he arrives, he exerts the moral authority on the places. Um, And those kind of, and, and he's also dressed a lot of the time in Victorian Edwardian clothes and stuff. And I think both of those things are harking back to an earlier kind of adventure fiction and, and, and you know, the sort of boy's own stories and that, that kind of stuff. But by mixing that boy's own kind of adventure stuff with science fiction, you've immediately got something that feels very H.G. Wells. Yeah, sure. Just in that, and whether that is by coincidence, whether that's by intention, I think the influences are much wider. But I, but yeah, it's very easy to see a link between, but what what Wells was doing and what Doctor Who was doing, and and it wasn't exactly a struggle to make a documentary about the links between Wells and Doctor Who. Yeah, sure. I mean, I guess in a way, he's a composite of lots of Victorian heroes. It's a melting pot, but Wells is there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this has been fascinating. And really useful. So, oh. Simon, thank you so much for for joining me. My pleasure. My pleasure. Um, is there is there any is there anything you'd like to uh, you'd like to to promote or like to say say about that you've got floating around that people can can check out? Uh, yeah. So the next things I've got out are I work quite a lot for a, a company called Big Finish who do audio productions. Uh, they have done uh, a, a, an audio version of The War of the Worlds. Uh, called the I think it's called the invasion invasion of the Martians or something um, uh, okay in fact I should probably look that up so I get <laughs> I will um I'll add it to the show notes okay um uh but I've got a couple of Doctor Who things coming up uh so there's a story called Shadow of the Daleks which is out in October um which has all been written in lockdown Amazing. And, uh, and then I have a um a trilogy of stories uh out in November called uh, wicked sisters in which uh doctor who has to uh destroy two godlike beings so there we go was i a bit unfair on old herbert george maybe although as an academic in science in the late 1800s it must have been very difficult to avoid ideas of eugenics and general structural racism for the most part though uh, kind of amazingly it seems like wells is on the right side of history of this sort of stuff 
I mean, that sort of stuff being the point of view that colonialism and racism is bad. And, and the right side of history also being something that it still seems like we're still working through a lot of the shit to get on with. Thanks, world. Fear not. Will we explore whether Wells was big on women's rights? Yes. Will we look at what his thoughts were on LGBT rights? But may maybe. I'll be honest, as far as his sexual preference goes, he was a wildly heterosexual man who died in 1946 before a lot of the gay rights movement as we know it today was taking place. But if I find anything, you better believe you'll hear about it, honey. Thanks for listening, guys, and join us next week for Chapter 11 at the window. In the meantime, please, 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 the please, 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 the please, 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 the please, 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 the please. Give the podcast a quick review on Apple Podcasts. Even if you don't listen on there, it takes only a few minutes to give it a five star rating, a couple of sentences, and it helps others find the show. The algorithms kick in and it gets more visible. As always, you can ask me anything on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at edyhurst or email me at eddiehurst at gmail.com. Special thanks to Simon Gerrier for coming on the show. You can follow him on Twitter and Instagram at Zero Tralala, and if you'd like to find out more about his work with HG Wells, well, guess what? You absolutely can and should. The documentary that uh, prompted me to get in touch with him originally was, uh, was HG and the H-Bomb, which I used for research in Chapter 6, so uh, you can listen to that on the BBC iPlayer following the link that I've put in the show notes. As we spoke about later in the chat, he's also made a documentary on H.G. Wells and Doctor Who that you can get on the DVD of Doctor Who The Ark. Simon also has an upcoming episode of Doctor Who in the series The Shadow of the Daleks, coming out on Big Finish in October, and he's written the Doctor Who Wicked Sisters trilogy that's out in November. Links to all of these are in the show notes below. Thanks again, guys, for listening, and I'll see you next week for Chapter 11 at the Window. This has been Eddie Hurst's podcast version of The War of the Worlds.